A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord always. I shall say it again, rejoice. Your kindness should be known to all. The Lord is near. Have no anxiety at all, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. Keep on doing what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Then the God of peace will be with you. In you, Lord, I have found my peace. In you, Lord, I have found my peace. O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor are my eyes haughty. I busy not myself with great things, nor with things too sublime for me. In you, Lord, I have found my peace. Nay, rather, I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child, like a weaned child on its mother's lap. So is my soul within me. In you, Lord, O Israel, hope in the Lord both now and forever. Dominus Fabiscum, et ut spiritu tuo, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matthäum, Gloria Ti, Piet Domine. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him by asking, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Verbum Domini. Last Love God and love of neighbor. These are the two pillars of the entire moral law, the heart of the Old Testament law, Jesus tells us. We have the first three commandments about love of God and the next seven about how we are to love our neighbor. That's it's our direction on how we are to live to shape 
our lives. It's the focus of the moral life. It's the measure of holiness, right? How are we living this law? How are we growing in virtue and practicing this law? You know, holiness is not measured by the office we hold, maybe the office in the church or in society. It's not our personal vocation even. You know, how we live that vocation in charity, you know, as a measure of our holiness. It's not any special work that we have to do that measures our holiness or talents or gifts or even spiritual manifestations or experiences, supernatural revelations, personal revelations that we have, visions, locutions, none of that stuff, right? It's the practice of charity is the measure of holiness. So we have to live these commandments, you know, with all our heart, you know, and all our strength. We see in the Old Testament, God gave his people, his chosen people, the law. In the New Testament, he sends his son. And the newness of the new covenant there is really the figure of Christ himself, that he fulfills the law, that he gives flesh and blood to these concepts. That we see that God is love in Jesus Christ, what he did for us, how he lived, how he obeyed his Father, how he came to seek to do the will of the Father, his love for the Father we see, you know, being obedient to the point of death, and his love for us, that he offered himself up for us on Calvary, sacrificed himself for us on Calvary. So we see the supreme expression of the law in Jesus Christ. So in our encounter with God, with Jesus, we experience this great love, right? God, his love, St. John tells us. And he also tells us, St. John, that God first loves us. Not that we've loved God, that, but that he has first loved us. And Romans 5 tells us that he's poured that love into our hearts. So Jesus commands us to love one another, but only that command arises from the fact that he has first loved us. Through this encounter we have had with him, we can in turn love others, right? Because in this encounter we have a, as Pope Benedict describes in his encyclical and on uh, God is love, he says we have this communion of wills with Jesus, right? We become friends with, us, friends with him, so much so that it even affects our feelings, our sentiment. It totally transforms us, that we can love others even to the point of loving our enemies, even to the point of loving people we don't like because we've been transformed by our encounter with Christ. So in becoming his friends, we love what he loves, that in and with Christ I can love all people, even my enemies, I can see the divine image within them. So it's first given to us and then we give it to others. St. John also asks, <coughs> how can we love the God we cannot see if we do not love the, the brother or our neighbor that we do see? So there is an interplay between these two commandments that in serving and loving one another, it opens our eyes to what God has done for me, for how he loves me and how uh, he is good to me, merciful to me and forgives me of my sins. I can in turn be merciful, forgiving and serving of my brothers and sisters. So there's this interplay, this connection. I think we've all experienced that. By loving, we grow in love. By loving our brothers and sisters, we see God's love for us in a deeper way. I think especially of, of forgiving one another. I think when we forgive our brothers and sisters, we experience God's forgiveness of ourselves. That's a powerful way to encounter God, right? To make that act of forgiveness, to let go of the offense against us. If we don't do this, our religious devotions and the practice of our duties of our faith grow cold, become sterile. It's not inflamed by love. If we don't have this love of our, our neighbor. How does the church live out these commandments of love of God and love of neighbor? Her mission, right, is to proclaim the good news, right? To preach the gospel, to administer the sacraments, 
and to perform works of charity, which we see in the life of St. Martin de Porres today, this great saint of uh, Lima, Peru. He was a third order Dominican, and he had a great love and service of the poor. He was always uh, helping the poor. He had uh, many miraculous healings <laughs> that he would perform by God's grace on people. A marvelous witness, also his teachings. He had many spiritual teachings that you know, affected many people and led people to Christ. And that's an image of the role of the church, right? To preach this truth, to administer the sacraments, to perform works of charity, to form a civilization of love. So this, as a Christian, this love of neighbor that we are to have drives us to build a just society in which all are secure in basic fundamental human rights, right? A, a Christianity does not mean that I just have my own personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, right? It impels me, informs me to go out and transform the world, to serve my brothers and sisters. We say that the earth has been given to man, right, in creation. Adam and Eve placed in a garden, the gardens entrusted to them and they are to use it as good stewards. They are to develop it and to develop themselves, right? And to grow in their own humanity, so to speak, to fully realize themselves in developing the earth and enjoying the goods of the earth that God has given us. So our love of neighbor wants to ensure that all can enjoy this, right? That's what a, a just society means, that all can enjoy the goods of the earth that's been given to all according to God's plan. So our government and our politics are to be ordered according to this love. John Paul II in his great encyclical 1991, Centissimus Annus, it was written on the 100th anniversary of Rerum Novarum. This is one of the great social encyclicals of the church. He speaks of these rights that must be secured for human beings, right? And he said, among the most important of these rights, mention must be made of the right to life, an integral part of which is the right of the child to develop in the mother's womb from the moment of conception. He says, the right to live in a united family and in a moral environment conducive to the growth of the child's personality the right to develop one's intelligence and freedom and seeking and knowing the truth, the right to share in the work which makes wise use of the earth's material resources and to, and to derive from that work the means to support oneself and one's dependents, and the right to establish a family, to have and to rear children through the responsible exercise of one's sexuality, in a certain sense, the source and synthesis of these rights is religious freedom, understood as the right to live in the truth of one's faith and in conformity with one's transcendent dignity as a person. Right? This religious freedom is at the core, the center, the source of all these other human rights that uh, the government is supposed to protect. You know, if man is to fulfill himself, he must seek, he must find, he must live the truth, right? We must guide our lives according to the truth of our humanity, according to the truth of the moral law, how he is to live, <coughs> especially religious truth, right? That we are, we're destined to have eternal life in God. We're destined to experience salvation, right? We must have the freedom to seek that truth, to seek that salvation. We must have the freedom to live the natural law written in our hearts, foundation to, foundational to our human dignity. So the government must protect this freedom to seek the truth, to live the truth, and to find especially religious truth, to live this relationship we are to have with God. The government must protect it as a civil right, right, as a fundamental right, and can never coerce individuals to act contrary to their consciences. The just ordering of society is the work of politics, right? That we, through our political systems, 
We want to create this just environment that secures all these rights I'm speaking of. And we speak of a distinction of the role of the church and the state. That the state, its duty is to develop and govern you know, in this political system. We speak about what belongs to Caesar, right? And there's a proper autonomy, right, of the temporal sphere that's entrusted to the laity, you know, to develop these politics according to just principles. So the church doesn't dominate, run, or set up political systems, right? That's not her duty. That's the role of the laity. And the state, in its turn, should not impose a religion, right? Should not interfere with the role of the church. But the two are clearly interrelated. And this is how Pope Benedict describes it. I think this is a beautiful description in his encyclical Deus Caritas S, God is Love. He said, and speaking of the church's social doctrine, he says, the church has no intention of giving, or the, the social doctrine has no intention of giving the church power over the state. Even less is it an attempt to impose on those who do not share the faith ways of thinking and modes of conduct proper to faith. Its aim is simply to help purify reason and to contribute here and now to the acknowledgement and attainment of what is just. Right? So faith is to guide reason, is to purify reason. You know, the church has this role to point out where these human basic fundamental human rights are being violated and to give principles about how the the world is to be ordered to a just system. It's not promoting a confessional state where we force people to live by a, a Catholic faith, so to speak, but certainly to live by the, you know, the natural moral law, right, and to protect these human rights, such as the right to life. So all this obviously is heading towards Tuesday, this homily, right? And we vote in this country for our president. And we have a civic duty, right? We have a responsibility. In loving our neighbor, we need to seek a just political system. We have a, a moral imperative, right, to vote if we're able to, and, uh, and to vote according to these Christian principles, not checking our faith or our reason at the door, the voting booth, but we act according to these principles. Right, the church, I mean, this, you know, the, the world, the secular world wants to tell Christians, well, you know, just keep your principles to yourselves. And again, I'm not imposing my Catholicism on others. I am trying to vote according to that promote just fundamental human rights, the right to life, right, the right to religious freedom. And I need to vote according to those principles, right? There's not some kind of bizarre dichotomy between what I value and how I vote. I vote according to these values. I vote according to my principles of faith and according to the principles of reason. There's no contradiction there. So in a democracy, we have a, a serious responsibility, right, to vote. We have this privilege to affect, you know, our government, our society, our culture in such a, a dramatic way in the voting booth. You know, the laity, their proper role and function is to order the temporal sphere, to order this world to God's justice according to reason, according to principles of faith. And we need to vote along those lines. So we have this serious responsibility to get out and vote, to get out and vote, and to help others, right? I know a large group of our audience is the elderly. I just encourage you at home to exercise this right, this privilege you have to vote. Others listening, maybe to help them get to the voting booths, right? If they're not able to get there, if they can no longer drive or they're homebound in some way, great work of charity, right? To help them to exercise their rights to vote. So let's uh, do this and certainly pray for the election as we pray our rosary today after mass. Pray for God's wisdom and his guidance to be upon us and to bless this country.